ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the session 2 of the second day of historia conference 2021 it's good to have you back here now we'll be starting with tejas and nayan who will be introducing the next set of presenters so i request tejas and nayan onto the screen please at some point in your lives there is a chance you pondered upon your existence it makes sense that you would do so one says god gave us life while another says that we were apes is there a right theory here we have hansini and rishi a pair of talented curious minds who love to keep learning and researching about concepts that have intrigued them the mp of grade 8 of the mighty oak campus rishi is a very open minded and friendly person who mingles with everyone he is very helpful and collaborative to tell you the truth there is nothing he is not interested in He is a Carnatic music vocalist, an avid reader, a sports and fitness enthusiast, and an impressive speaker. He aspires to be a singer and a chemist. His hobbies include reading about various topics, playing cricket, coding, and browsing the internet. He participates in many extracurricular activities and competitions, such as public speaking, science fairs, and other exams, and has fared fared pretty well. He excels in his ex- academics and develops a deep understanding of each concept. Hansini is a very knowledgeable, artistic, and approachable person. She is a great thinker and always seeks to find answers to her questions. She is an impeccable orator, an intelligent partner, and a voracious reader too. She is very good at art and loves science. She is very ambitious, hardworking, and straightforward. Who has earned accolades and appreciation in speaking competitions. she plays badminton and reads articles in a leisure time and aspires to be a neurosurgeon one similarity between them is that they are interested in virtually everything and spend time discussing their opinions and uh, both of them have a mutual understanding they met each other in the online classes and they thought they would be good partners because of their shared interest in bhp science and books want to learn more please welcome hansini and rishik who are here to present their understanding of human evolution we wish you good luck in our modern and comfortable lives we have so many devices that makes our lives a bit easier it can be hard to imagine our lives without them right how hard can it be just for now imagine yourself holding a stick or spear and stare at an animal I know this image is a bit far-fetched, but this is an insight on our ancestors' lives. Hunting was a huge aspect in our history. It helped our ancestors' lives a bit, a bit. It helped our ancestors' lives. It also made them a bit more effective. Because of their efforts and their lifestyle, we are who we are. Hi, I'm Hansini, and this is my partner Rishi, and we're going to talk about our origin story. Various three combines expert knowledge and research to form interconnected story about the history of the universe, including all of the crucial happenings and their causes and how they are related to our lives today. It gives us a clear picture of where we are in this colossal time-space continuum, and tells us what may be happening in the future. It involves different disciplines and their involvement and interconnectedness in the compilation of history. and covers many uncovered aspects it shows how complexity increases with goldilocks conditions diverse ingredients and emergent properties at each threshold and that's so we were able to understand human evolution and how each and every characteristic of ours came to be what makes humans different from other species this is our driving question while we cover different aspects about humans uniqueness will be answering this question in many different ways and will be broadening the perspective on how we are more diverse compared to other organisms as we are learning about our history we should look at the people who are behind giving this information i will not discuss about the specific people who are behind it but the scientific fields that helped us understand this Can you please go to the next slide? 
Anthropologists and archaeologists and geneticists helped us understand this, helped us understand more about human evolution. Anthropologists study prehistoric societies and human behavior. They did this in the past. They helped us learn about human evolution by looking at their fossils. They also did this by looking at taking DNA samples but of different ethnic groups. This allowed us to learn about different genetic changes over the time. Archaeologists study past human activity by excavating, dating, and interpreting historical objects. In other words, artifacts. They help us understand about our ancestral journey from Africa to other countries. They did this by looking at analyzing different objects and using their critical thinking skills. And genesis. And genesis study different genes and include and study about how they're inherited, mutated, or activated. They often study the role of that genes play in viruses and other diseases. They help us understand about genealogy as well. This may look really funny. Have you ever thought, where did I come from? Am I related to monkeys? Why am I standing upright? Did you ever think about our relationship with chimpanzees, though it may sound funny? Before we fully understand about our evolution, we should talk about the origins of this theory. Back in the 1800s, a lot of people thought that God made us. This theory is still evident in the 21st century, but, but we have other scientific data to, to prove that we were actually adapted and, we were, and there was actually a common ancestor that we had. Jean Baptiste Lamarck proposed this theory of transmutation of species. It was the first fully formed theory of evolution. He did this in the early 1800s. In 1858, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace published a new evolutionary theory, explaining detail in Darwin's honest origin of the species. Even though this book did not talk about human evolution specifically, it did spark the conversation of it. This book talks about natural selection and how every single species goes through this. Natural selection is basically when, basically when different species adapt and become adapt to a point where they can reproduce and, and eat and basically become living organisms. And after 32 years, Eugene de Bois discovered the first Homo erectus, which is the upright man. These were some, there are some adaptations to Darwin's theory. In 1968, Monte Kumara uses his idea that evolution was adapted. He thought that the evolution was kind of was a caused by random genetic drifts instead of being adapted. This theory is called a neutral theory of molecular evolution. And even though there are some flaws in this theory, people still find it effective even now. Here, I'll be speaking about what our early ancestors did, how they lived, and what and what they ate too. First, I would like to tell you something. There are two reasons why we focus a little more on humanity in big history, but there's a lot more to talk about other than this. The selfish reason is that we are naturally curious to figure where we belong in this huge sequence of, sequence of events beginning with the Big Bang. We are also responsible for rapid change in the universe because of our ability to understand complex topics and communicate, we have caused a lot of technological evolution and change in the climate too. Our unit, the unit that we chose is unit six, early humans. And this contains threshold six, which is collective learning. Collective learning is the ability to retain knowledge in one generation than more than being lost in the, pre, in the other generation. When the dinosaurs wiped out, were wiped out by an asteroid, mammals prospered, evolving into a great range of species. One group lived in trees and ate fruit. They had hands, stereoscopic vision, and unusually large brains. These are our ancestors, the primates. Our own species, Homo sapiens, evolved around 200,000 years ago. We treat the appearance of humans as a new threshold because we caused highly uh, effective levels of complexity. For this threshold, powerful brains are one ingredient. Because of 
um, more neurons, we are able to understand complex concepts and analyze what they mean. The, sec the second ingredient required for this threshold is precise and versatile symbolic language. We are able to communicate our thoughts and ideas, and that's how we were able to develop our technology and tools. Finally, because of increasing in interactions between individuals and between communities, collective learning arised. We were able to share our ideas and build upon uh, information given by our elders and improve our techniques such as hunting. And that's how we came to be. So 65 million years ago, catastrophe wiped out the dinosaurs and we saw the adaptive radiation of a shoe-like ancestor of ours. That would not be your ideal travel partner during a vacation. He would be grunting the whole time. Meanwhile, in Africa, primates continue to evolve, our ancestors. And around 30 million years ago, the line of apes diverged from the old world monkeys. And no, we are not chimps or monkeys. They're like our cousins because our lines of uh, evolution split off from a common ancestor around 7 million years ago. Chimpanzees further split into a separate species, the bonobos. The bonobos. Knowing about this common ancestry tells us a lot about our similarities and our characteristics. For instance, we all have fairly large brains relative to our body mass, and we have depth perception so that we can see where the next branch is. We also have grasping hands so that we don't fall to our depths from a branch. Many of you may not know this, but human and chimpanzees who share 98.4% of their DNA are prone to ganging up, roaming our territory and beating up unsuspecting foreigners of the same species. And that's not for survival reason. We can contrast that behavior with the more peaceful bonobos who are female led. While our common ancestor was more suited to living in forests and seeking refuge from dangers by climbing trees, climate change in East Africa replaced forests with grasslands, woodlands, and savanna, which meant that our ancestors could not climb onto the very less trees and had to run away from predators. And this caused us to develop from the bow leg stance to bipedalism, which is standing upright with two legs and walking. This also freed up our hands. We know that by the first Australopithecines around 4 million years ago, our evolutionary line was bipedal. Think about how complicated it was to create the technologies around you. Now ask yourself if during your lifetime, you could never speak to another human being and how much of the technology could you dream up or build? No matter how smart and creative you are, the answer is very simple, no. In various aspects like literature, sciences, and legal systems, communication of information is crucial. The wonders of human culture are the result of the accumulation of the ideas and creativity of millions of individuals over generations and their communication. Humans are more like network computers with a more or less infinite capacity for memory to expand. Because of how we can communicate and share knowledge, we can tap into a vast information network by assembled by millions of humans, whether dead or alive. No one knows everything. Human knowledge is distributed among individuals when necessary and passed on and added by each generation. Early evidences of collective learning can be seen in foraging societies and early humans. Elders passed on hunting knowledge to the younger ones. For example, aiming at the prey, finding out where food is available and hiding under bushes. When humans were moving from moving to Australia, they would need, they would have needed to build upon their knowledge of sea travel. And that's how they would be able to identify and develop great boat, build, boat building and navigation skills. People learn to attach stone blades to sticks. Hafting is the process of taking stone, stone blades, which are very sharp, and attaching them to wood implements using fibers. This is a combination of two skills. One, 
sharpening flint and rocks to make them useful for attacking and using fibers to stick them to wood sticks this was useful and helped them hunt now we come to a very long lasting debate and which is still ongoing the classical view of foraging life is best expressed by thomas hobbes who wrote no arts no letters no society and worst of all continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man solitary poor nasty brutish and short he feels that foraging life is not as good compared to civilization because there is less of creativity and entertainment the lack of wealth disparity in foraging cultures may imply greater equality between social rankings and even genders since female gatherers appear to be more responsible for majority of food gathering rather than hunting males from that perspective life was kind of ruined by the advent of agriculture and later with states as jean jacques rousseau said the first person having enclosed a plot of land took it to his head and to say this is mine found people simple enough to believe him was the true founder of civil society what crimes wars murders what miseries and horrors would the human race have been spared had someone pulled up the stakes and filled this ditch and cried out to his fellow men do not listen to this impostor you are lost if you forget that the fruits of earth belong to this belong to all and the earth to no one this summarizes one of the great debates in the world of political science now it's possible that neither rousseau nor hobbes was completely correct and that private property and agriculture didn't create the glory days or end them surveys of excavated remains show that a paleolithic indication which shows that a murder rate of 10% was present that's really high this means that life in the paleolithic would not be as attractive as we think of it including the occasional infanticide and not to mention the death of old age old age people when they couldn't keep up any more they were left in the wild to die but how you interpret the lives of early human foragers largely determines your view of history and also the fundamental nature of the human character is hobbes correct or rousseau or are both of them correct we can think about this for a long time before we learn about our, the lifestyles of our ancestors we have to know who our ancestors were the australopithecines were they possess were um, a genus of ancient hominids they possessed a gene that helped us increase the number of neurons Prehistoric had robust skulls, and when I mean robust, they had huge, they had um, girdle like such a breast. This means they had strong chewing muscles. The Homo habilis is based on Latin word meaning handy. This species is known as a handyman because there were a lot of tools near near their skulls and skeletons. The name Homo ergaster roughly translates to working man. This is a reference to more advanced tools used by these species. The Homo erectus was the first relative that had human-like proportions. The Homo heidelbergensis was the first hunters of large animals. The Andertals were a group of archaic people. Their, because of their DNA, we could resist viruses and viruses and bacteria. Homo sapiens are us. We are we are the modern version of these ancestors. We, st we started our culture and uh, and advanced and we, we had more advanced tools. Jane Goodall is a primatologist who pioneered the study of chimpanzees in the wild, showing the world how similar chimpanzee behavior is that to of humans, and helping to demonstrate the close evolutionary relationship of the two species. When she was over a year old, her father gave her gave her a stuffed toy of a chimpanzee, and it was a lifelike replica. An early interest in animal life developed in her mind. Later in her life. She wrote her definitive scientific work, *The Chimpanzees of Gombe: Patterns of Behavior*. 
She summarized and analyzed the data gathered gathered by herself and others at Bombay. By this time, the data challenged her belief in the inherent goodness of chimpanzees. For the first ten for the first ten years, she thought that they were rather nicer than humans. But later onwards, she had to acknowledge that in certain circumstances, such as competition for food, sexual partners, or territory, or under emotions of jealousy, fear, or revenge. their behavior prov- proved as dark and troubling as humans including acts of warfare cannibalism murder and brutality but at the same time chimpanzees often demonstrate mutual mutual sharing helping and compassion and there are a lot of bonds between mothers and children mary and louis leakey were paleoanthropologists and most of the time most of their discoveries were at olduvai gorge where they uncovered fossils of ancient hominines and the earliest hominins as well as the stone tools produced by the hominins they discovered a very old skeleton of a female hominine found which was 3.2 million years old and they named it lucy this helped them understand the lifestyles of the people of that time Another important thing that we need to notice is bipedalism which is walking on two legs upright. It is one of the most important and turning points in human history and it happened 6 million years ago. A lot of researchers speculate that we moved to the grasslands because of climate change and as i mentioned before we could not climb the trees and had to run away from predators. Climate change and low food availability could have helped us develop into modern humans. we also lost our fur to control our body temperature in the hot savanna now we will discuss about prehistoric societies now as we all know we all have jobs in our societies and their jobs were scavengers tool makers hunters and fishermen scavengers collected food tool makers made the tools that they used to hunt and hunters as you know they they basically hunted animals to have food I mean this is a, you can also use foragers to describe them. And fishermen were people who fished who fished and this this practice dated back to the Paleolithic age. And cave paintings show that seafood was important for survival. Prehistoric diets consisted of as consisted of meat, plants and other things. And when it comes to gathering food, humans like to maximize their gains and minimize their costs. This was the economics behind their diet. And our ancestors, just like us, like bone marrow, like like to um junk food. And their idea of junk food was bone marrow, oil-rich nuts, and these were heavily processed. But our ancestors tried to get them because, and the simple reason for this is basically because they wanted it, and they just wanted it. And researchers argue that the Stone Age diet fits our genetic makeup. It also this diet also might have increased our brain size and our gut size, and because of that, we could have processed more meat. In prehistoric life, as you all know, that we mostly forage, and forage is basically when you're trying to hunt or look for food, look for food for enlarged beneficence. And there is some evidence that they actually had some spiritual beliefs. There's archaeological evidence that states that Neanderthals had a network of various religious beliefs, and this was in modern-day northern Iraq. There was a cave painting that explained this, and it also is another surprising thing was that the work was divided equally b- between both genders. It was not one was it was not based on gender lines. Let's continue. As I said before. Foraging is basically looking for large provisions, and large provisions and searching for food. We could also say this; it could also be used for hunting and gathering. This aspect o- occupies our history at least for ninety percent. We could say this that this made us human. As few as fruit trees in, our, in the forest in the rainforest became less abundant, our ancestors had to find other ways of finding food. In this might have they might have repeated seasonal movements that based on animal migrations. Tribes had at least fifteen to thirty people. They were split if necessary. Let's continue. 
Can you please continue? So the migration, the Great Migration was basically about how our ancestors moved to Africa to other places. So first of all, we occupied other regions of the continent. According to Wikipedia, they went through mountains and other difficult physiographic, physiographic features to go to Eurasia. This happened 90,000 to 55,000 years ago. After that, we moved to the western parts of Europe. This happened 55 to 30,000 years ago. After this, we moved to other parts of Europe, North America and South America. This happened 30,000 to 10,000 years ago. After that, we moved to other parts of the world. And this happened to, and this happened 10,000 to 1,000 years ago. And, this, and there are actually two theories of evolution. One theory suggests that there's a spe the species of Homo sapiens dispersed throughout the globe. And, and then after that, modern humans developed from them. And another theory called out of Africa hypothesis says that modern humans evolved in Africa and then moved to other places. What's the layer between them is that this explains the journey of our ancestors. The we should learn about human ancestry because, because it helped us know who we are. And as Rashik said before, that if we know more about if we know more about us, then we can advance to different different technological um, technological things and help help our lives to get better. And in fact, there is evidence that if we learn about our ancestry, we could actually solve different diseases. And, and a lot of people might be thinking, how did, and how did we get white skin and all? We got white skin because of gene mutations and environmental features. These are some views of human evolution. So many people have different views of uh, um, human evolution. Some people think that um, God created humans as we are today. And some people think that we evolved with God guiding us. And many people also say that God has no part in process and humans evolved because of um, adaptation. Here's an activity for you. And this may be like a small provocation so that you can get to know about the order of uh, our ancestors. So here are some pictures of our ancestors, namely Homo sapiens, Homo habilis, Neanderthals, Australopithecus, and Homo erectus. So based on the picture numbers, try naming them and organizing them in order of their appearance. I'll give you 30 seconds and then I'll reveal the answers. You can also um, organize them based on what we have mentioned previously about their characteristics in our presentation. And also based on uh, different characteristic changes that we can see from picture to picture. All right. So the earliest was the Australopithecus and that is picture number two. Next, we have Homo habilis which is picture number three, and then Homo erectus in picture number five. And then we have the Neanderthals, which are our close ancestors, which is picture number four. And finally, picture number one is us, Homo sapiens. So throughout this um, presentation, you may have seen uh, you may have seen and noticed different vocabulary which has been used. So I'll name a few and what they mean. Collective learning is the ability to share, preserve, and build upon knowledge, knowledge over time. Evolution is a sequence of events involved in the evolutionary development of a species or taxonomic group of organisms. And foraging is the act of searching for food and provisions. And nomadic means migratory and not staying in one place and moving from place to place. Neanderthals are the, are the extinct robust humans of Middle Paleolithic in Europe and Western Asia. Hominins are all bipedal species in the human line since it diverged from the common ancestor with chimpanzees. 
thank you so much for listening to our presentation we would like to thank all of those teachers friends and our parents who have guided us and supported us throughout our preparation and have given us feedback on how we need to present it is not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent that survives it is the one that is the most adaptable to change that lives within the means available and works cooperatively said charles darwin the father of human evolution theory here are the credits and resources from which we derived our information most of it was from the biggest tree project where all of the videos and articles provided us with clarity and we were able to derive our information from there so thank you so much everybody we hope you like our presentation thank you well that was a really good answer to those questions in our minds why do we exist how did we come to be what decisions did we make and finally how are we different from other species they have given us a vivid picture of each important change in our evolution hansini and rishi have clearly understood how early humans lived and how they developed their tools we also got to know that how scientists connect the dots and find evidence i am actually asked to wish to know that chimpanzees have similar behavior to humans i finally understand how we are different from monkeys and apes and how we are walking upright today the key concepts of collective learning evolution and foraging have been presented beautifully okay uh, so now we will be having a short q and a session for hansini and rishi Okay, so I request the entire audience, the students and the teachers, to take the devices and go to www. menti. com and use the code six two nine four eight seven one. I repeat, the code is six two nine four eight seven one. Please grab your devices and ask them questions. Okay, so we have your first question here. What inspired you to join Historia? I guess what inspired me to join Historia is uh, that we that we were interested in BHP and we wanted to learn more about like our existence and all. And we also and we also wanted to improve our critical thinking skills as well through this and present our and improve our communicative skills. Yeah. Uh, so my perspective on this is that. Uh, so um, I got to know about Historia in sixth grade, where uh, some of the previous Historia presenters talked to us and gave us tips about uh, our uh, PYP exhibition. So I, from then onwards, I I really wanted to participate in Historia. And later onwards, when I came to seventh grade and uh, and then in eighth, where we learned a lot more about BHP and big history from the time of our, from the Big Bang to early humans and today so i felt that maybe we could present our knowledge and uh, also listen to other presentations and understand uh, their perspectives and their understandings of different aspects of big history that was really interesting to know okay so the next thing what is your favorite thing about the So I guess my favorite thing about this topic is that we learn that we are all connected, and there is and there's like no point of like this of um or discriminating each other. So I guess that's one one of my favorite things about this topic, and also I get to learn about who I am, and where I'm from. So what I like about uh, early humans and their evolution is that uh, we get to know about every single uh, characteristic of ours, which is bipedalism. 
death perception and how they came to be how our ancestors were and uh, how they changed uh, due to climate and uh, adaptation and uh, how we are ourselves so one shocking fact is that um, we are actually all africans and like our skin tone changed because of moving from uh, um, one place to other places in the world and due to changes in uh, the intensity of the sun uh, our skin color changed so that's really shocking and it's also great to know about how we are related to chimpanzees and how they're kind of similar to us that's really amazing So what were the difficulties you faced? I guess my difficulties was like we, um, that we had to do this online. If we were face to face, it would be a bit easier. And also, and also we did have some differences in opinions, but we did overcome that. And but overall, this was a pretty good experience. Yeah, I agree with Tanzani. uh but um so online presentation was a limitation but we were able to overcome that um we also uh, were overwhelmed by the amount of information given in bhp and we had to compile that only and only cover a few topics so that took a lot of time and then we had to um uh, work on presenting it in a way interesting so that the audience are attracted so that was um some obstacles and difficulties which we faced well i'm happy you overcame that so how did you manage your time studies in history how did you balance all of these i guess um i I uh, managed uh, my time by making a like a schedule and trying to like uh, put my priorities right. I like, put my, uh, what is more important, and I guess that's one of the ways that I manage my time. And I that's all I have to say about this topic. Yeah. Uh, so actually, at the beginning, so after we chose our topic, we took some time to uh, get our, uh, ourselves together. and uh, f- like um, compile our information and all of that so sometimes we uh, crossed the uh, time that we kept um, but we were able to prioritize and uh, um, we divided our work and so that we could review it later and so that we could reduce our workload and uh, that's how we managed our time and uh, normal studies that's good to know well now because of the time constraint we will not be taking any more questions but i would like to thank uh, rishik and hansini once again for their amazing informative presentation thank you so much everyone thank you